speaker, Miss Sherry. And so everybody's very much encouraged. Appreciate that. And next event coming up on your schedule, Century Challenged. Amen. So you're getting real close to having a whole lot of scriptures handed to you. Amen. You are so excited. That's great. <coughs> Man. <laughs> you should have been here for Sunday school. Then you'd be like, oh, this is going to be a worshipful experience as I'm memorizing all this scripture. And, uh, so that's coming up on September the 24th. We'll get that to you here shortly. Good to have the porters with us. And so glad yeah. Miss Charlotte's done with treatments and all that good stuff. So yeah. she's back. That's wonderful. Brother Christy, good on his eye surgery. And uh, so he's going back on Thursday on one eye. One eye's good. One eye's not so good. And uh, so be praying about that and see what the Lord does in the midst there. And I think that's all. Brother Ethan's got a devotion for us. Brother Ethan, why don't you come? Good morning. Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and I'll read verses 1 through 13. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, when took their lamps and went forth to meet the, bar the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they, and they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, when there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. We go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye, knew, know, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. At Faith Bible Institute, we got to study Paul and his preaching. And in his preaching, um, he always pushed for and had a sense of urgency. Urgency, of, of course, that the Lord is coming soon. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, Paul says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So in any given second, the rapture could happen. Now thinking back to the ten virgins, putting yourself in the place of those who were not prepared, and had to buy more oil, causing them to miss the wedding, um, at that point you'd wish you could turn back time of day so you could be prepared. When the rapture happens, it's instant and irreversible, so it's something we must all be prepared for. For those of us that, are, that have been saved and are prepared for it, it's something we look forward to. And our jobs as Christians in Matthew 28 19 is to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Knowing our security in Christ to the very end and his love for us, we should follow in obedience. In a few moments, the choir is going to sing, I'm still amazed. And one of the verses says, I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. Besides leaving us to die and be sent to a deserving hell, he sent his only begotten son to bear our sins and take our place as a sacrifice. This is the greatest news in the history of all news. And, is appointed, and there will be an important time when that news comes to a conclusion and serves its purpose. I wonder who this morning is unprepared and lacking oil, or know someone who is. When that unknown time comes, the unknown second that could have very well happened since I started my devotion, we got to ask ourselves, what else is God wanting to accomplish while we're still here? Because it's not us. It's a, our literal sole purpose is to accomplish God's purpose with our lives. I'll leave you with 2 Corinthians 3.5. Paul says, now that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, not to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And I'll leave those thoughts with you. Amen. Great reminder. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll start out in a word of prayer <clears throat> this morning. Our Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've allowed us to be able to come together. God, you've given us your grace, Lord, and the the 
privilege of being able to gather around your word, to be able to sing songs of faith. I pray, God, that you would equip us, Lord, in your word. I pray that you would continue to meet the needs of each person that's here. Lord, we all come with different uh, desires, different needs, Lord, of you at this time. Lord, some physical, all spiritual, Lord, we all stand to go closer to you. And I pray, Father, that you would help us in that. And I pray, God, that, um, that as we gather, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. Lord, there may be one that's without Christ that's here, and I do pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray, Lord, that you would remove all hindrances, all uh, opposition, Lord, and help us to be able to hear from you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take your red hymn books. Turn to page 410. Page 410. Faith is the victory. <clears throat> Along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe and veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind spread, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. That overcomes the world To him that overcomes the foe White raiment shall be given Before the angels he shall know His name confessed in heaven Then onward from the hills of light Our hearts with love aflame Will vanquish all the host of night In Jesus' conquering name Faith is the victory Faith is the victory Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Great singing. 178 is going to be our next hymn. 178, Jesus Loves Even Me. <clears throat> So glad that our Father in heaven tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And Brother Jimmy, would you ask a blessing on our offering, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed and the life you gave on the cross, Lord. 
redeem us of our sin. We thank you, Lord, that we're not in bondage of our sins and bound for hell yes, We thank you, Lord, that you hold us in your hands and nothing or no one can take us from you. That's true. We pray, Lord, you'll give us a attentive heart here for the preaching of your word. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to take what we hear here today, apply it to our lives and share it with us. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Yes, Lord, your word tells us that when uh, two or more are gathered together in your name, that you are in the midst of them. We are gathered in your name here today, and we welcome your presence. Yes, we pray, Lord, that all we do and say here today will be pleasing to you. We ask, Lord, you take this offering, bless it, multiply, use it for your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated.
never get over that amazement. Amen. Let's take your red hymn books one more time. Turn to page 202. 202. You can remain seated on this one. 202. My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His one love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In his boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely gave Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer With his blood he purchased me On the cross he sealed my pardon Paid the dead and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, His triumphant power I'll tell. How the victory He gave it over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my pardon, paid my debt and made me free. Amen. Great singing. Let's all stand together and let's turn over to 419. 419, sound the battle cry. After the first verse, choir is going to make their way down as we continue to sing <clears throat> this morning. 419. <clears throat> Prevail. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light, battling for the right we look and fail. Roused then soldiers rally round the banner, proud he said he passed the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. O thou God of all, hear us when we call, help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Rouse then soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, 
pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Amen. One more. Let's go to 397. 397. Little is much when God is in it. <clears throat> Field now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and do not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle, in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it, live or not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say to all the faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Appreciate that. And everybody can be seated with the exception of the ladies that were here at the conference yesterday. And then you got a song that you're supposed to be singing. <clears throat> That's what I hear. Come on up. You didn't even know, did you? Surprise. No, Amen. It's not a surprise. Oh, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise. <laughs> I've got papers. Oh, look at that. Papers. Got a handout. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm thankful for the day. You did great. Thank you. Good. This one from the other side of the house. Yeah, do y'all want to do one side on the other side? Sure. Yeah. No. I like it. No. Oh, okay. You like that? You want to go over there and I'll stay over here? Okay, we'll be, we'll be the first and you'll be the second, okay? We got it? Okay, okay we're ready. Okay. Y'all sing loud.
That's a wonderful job. Man, all that just in one Saturday, man. <clears throat> I foresee a lot of specials coming. That is, that is great. All right, if you would, let's take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter number 40. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 40 this morning. And whenever you find your place, I'm going to ask you to stand with me one more time if you're able <clears throat> as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Genesis chapter number 40, and we're going to go down to the end of the chapter to verse number 20. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 40, verse number 20, and we're going to kind of jump right in here in the middle, but, um, but I'll catch you up. Amen. So Genesis 40, verse number 20, it says, And it came to pass the third day, which was Potiphar's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his, uh, among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. I want to bring a message this morning of things to remember when the world forgets. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the songs that have been sung, for the special music. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with, Lord. We are so, so very thankful. God, we, we have so much, Lord, that sometimes it clouds our vision of what's truly important, and that's you. So I pray, God, that you would help us to be able to restore our interest upon you in this hour. Help us, Lord, to be able to lay hold on all the things that you want us to be able to know. And Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for our nation, for this country. I pray, God, that you would continue to secure the freedoms that we have. Lord, we're so thankful that you've given us the ability to be able to meet here this morning and to be able to sing praises to you and to be able to look on your word together. I pray, God, that we never take it for granted. Help us, Lord, in this hour. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. Nineteen years ago, we saw people face death, uh, for the most part, greatly and completely unprepared. People were going about their routine lives. They were in office buildings. They were on airplanes. They were on city streets. Never imagining, uh, whenever they were at work that day, what it was that they were going to have to face. 2,977 lives were lost in a religious attack on September the 11th, 2001. But there were many more lives that were affected over uh, the course of the time. All over the world there were people that were watching in horror as U.S. was struck by Muslim terrorists. And everybody has a story about that day. If you were alive, you, were, uh, you, you got to hear it. it. It sticks out in your mind. You know what you were doing, where you were. I was working at, at uh, Temple Inland. I remember being in my office and I got a phone call asking if I'd seen the things that were taking place. This is before internet was very live stream. And um, anyway, I went up to our boiler room, <clears throat> and they had a television there. And I was watching it all unfold. And there was just a group of people that were standing around and seeing the very freedoms that we have. They were under attack. To see the loss of life, the people that were <clears throat> beyond anything that they could imagine that it just fell, you know, we just fell victim as, a, as an entire country. And yet, you see all these things and knowing that there was nothing that could be done. So many emotions. There were tears that were shed when people realized they were about to die. There was the shock of those that, that jumped to their death out of buildings to avoid being burned alive. And there's still tears that are shed whenever you watch the footage. And you hear the last calls and you understand what it is that people were going through at that time. It doesn't seem like 19 years has passed. It seems like it was just a, a moment ago. And on that day there were people that began to cry out to God. There were people that were searching for answers. There were people that were ready to have the Word of God given to them. Nobody was concerned whether or not you brought your Bible to school on that day because everybody knew that there had to be some kind of a comfort and they were looking to be able to receive whatever it was, whatever that source was. And that call was given to never forget the responders and the last calls and the funerals of children. And yet we live in a world that is vastly forgotten. Amen. We live in a world that just doesn't really relate to it anymore. And there will be some tributes and some recollections, but the reality of it is past. Today there's destruction going on in our country from the inside. 
We're not a United States. We are a fragmented body that's being attacked by the inside. And I think about that so much that, uh, you know, whenever a country is blessed to the degree that we have, it doesn't take long before the, the battle is internal instead of external. It's often the external uh, uh, enemies that come about that actually rally around a uniting uh, of a group of people. But whenever you have too much time to yourself and whenever the interest is all about you and whenever the interest is all about all the stuff that you can gain before long, it starts tearing apart from the inside and many people for, forget the real cause that we're supposed to stand for. In under a month, those that had been calling out to God for help got up off their knees and now there's a new battle cry that we often see whenever the year comes around. Not on my watch. That's the thing. Not on my watch. And I was thinking about that expression this week. The new interest is the, the power of the nation rather than the power of God. People have gotten away from, from being on their knees crying out for God Almighty to be able to come to, to, our, to our rescue and to be able to help us. And instead we think we've got it handled all on our own. We often let ourselves forget. We get preoccupied with other things. Friday I went through and I was watching so many of those videos again. But as I watched, I started thinking about the millions of people every single month that go into eternity without Christ. I started thinking, who's watching the attacks that are against God's people today? Who's watching as so many churches are unable to even have service? They've been shut down. They said you can't meet together because there you might have a potential of getting sick. They're getting fined for meeting. Who's sounding the warnings? The gospel still has the power to save. Why is it not shared more? Where are those that are willing to serve the almighty God? Why is the interest waned? Why is it that people are so looking for different aspects of, of life and things to live rather than serving God? What happened whenever God wasn't good enough? Whenever we start looking for something else? Who's still watching? Jesus posed a great question to his disciples. Remember whenever he was praying, he was getting ready to go to the cross and, and he came back and found his disciples asleep and he said, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. That brings us to our text. <clears throat> we can learn a lot from the account of Joseph thinking about what it's like to be forgotten. To be left aside, putting aside the most important things give you some, some background. Uh, before our text, Joseph had been sold into slavery by, by his brothers. Joseph had been faithful to his father. He was doing exactly what it was that his father wanted him to do. He was faithful in his, in his service. Uh, he, he, God gave him a dream, and as such, he revealed that dream. Some people say he was selfish. I don't believe that. I believe he was doing exactly what you're supposed to do whenever God would reveal something as a dream. That's what a prophet was doing. They would receive some from God, and they shared. And it just so happens that what he was sharing was that the rest of his family was bowing down to him. Well, that didn't sit very well with his, with his brothers. They didn't appreciate that at all. And, uh, and that jealousy really began to eat him up. And, of course, it was furthered by preferential treatment of his father as well. Long story there. <clears throat> but uh, the, the time finally came where they had enough. And so they ended up selling uh, Joseph into slavery. He made his way to be a slave for Potiphar, uh, which was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. Great place to be. Uh, man, what a, uh, you know, a high-ranking official there. Can turn back to chapter 39 in our text in verse number 3. It says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in the eyes of Potiphar. Everything he touched turned out good. He was made the overseer of all his, all, all the household of Potiphar. And, and you know, amazingly enough, Potiphar's wife began to take recognition of him as well. Look at it, chapter 39, verse number 7. It says, And it came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Verse number 10 says, And it uh, came to pass that as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. It's an interesting progression, isn't it? She started off, she says, lie with me. And then a little later she says, just lie by me. Just be with me. You know, and that's the way the, the attack comes. It says day by day. That was the attack. It says, all right, uh, if you won't go to this degree of immorality, at least be close to me. At least be in the same room with me. And he would say, no, I'm not going to put myself in that position. Joseph was too interested in serving God to get wrapped up in sin and the direction that it was going to take him whenever God was obviously blessing his life and God had an interest in his life. And he said, I can't do that to my God. My God loves me. He's doing all, he says, I'm not going to be a part of what it is that you're asking me to do. 
Finally, Potiphar's wife, you remember the story, she, uh, she said, lie with me. She grabbed his, his garment, and he said, uh-uh. And uh, he didn't get his shoes or nothing, amen. And he left out. He left the, left the garment with her. And she said, you know, this is the last time that I'm going to be rejected. She was so upset about it, she called the men of the house. And she said, uh, Joseph, you know who he was. Uh, Joseph attacked me. He was trying to seduce me, and I got his garment. And, you know, I guarantee you that the men of the house that she got, this is the look that they gave. I think they knew all about Potiphar's wife. But regardless of that, Potiphar didn't need that getting around, so he has Joseph put in prison. You know, it's hard to go down when you're already a slave. Hey man, what's the next bottom rung? You would think you're going to, the progression, he goes from being a slave to being a prisoner. But it didn't really matter where he was. Why? Uh, look in chapter 39 again, verse number 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The Lord was with him. It's the third time, four different times we're told the Lord was with Joseph. Now he's in charge of the prison of which he is a resident. Amen. He's got his own cell, but he's been put in charge of everything that's going on. And one day there were these two men that get locked up with him. And there was a butler and, and a baker of the king of Egypt, which is Pharaoh. So Joseph <clears throat> goes in to check on them one day. Look in chapter 40, verse number 6. It says, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were what? They were sad. Imagine that. I'd be sad too, amen? But this is after a season. This wasn't they went to jail, the next morning they were sad. No, no, it wasn't it. They were in jail, and the, the preceding verses said that they were in there for a season. They were a season in the ward. They'd been there for a while. Joseph goes in to check on him. He looks at him. He says, man, you aren't your normal happy prisoner self. He said, you're, there's a sadness that is there among the people. It wasn't because they were in jail. It was because God had given them a dream, each a dream, a uh, different dream, but he would given each a dream uh, to them, and they didn't know what it meant. They couldn't figure it out. Well, that was something to think about. Joseph, man, he is the guy you need with dreams. He had had dreams before. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what got him in the part of the position that he was in to begin with. And so he said, you know, uh, God can interpret dreams. God can do what was the dream. So they told him all the details. Now, in verse number 13, we see the, the butler uh, he says, Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. Joseph tells the butler, he says, Man, just a few days you're going to be back to butlering. You're going to be, you're going to be set up. Everything's going to be good. It's going to be lifted up. It's going to be great. Well, the baker hears that. Amen? So, oh, he got a good one. It's like going to Del Rio. Let me give you some good advice. Get your ticket. The next, well, that's a good one. Let me get another ticket. They don't give you the bad tickets. That's what the baker's thinking. Baker's thinking, Butler got a good word. I'm going to get a good word too. Wasn't a good word. Look down to verse number 19. It says, uh, Yet within three days shalt Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee. That's not good. It wasn't lift up your head. It was lift off your head. From off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. What a word. You know, sometimes you're just sorry you ask. Amen? <laughs> that was him. Now, here's the kicker. Whenever Joseph tells the butler, he says, three days you're going to be released. You're going to be set free. Notice what he says in verse number 14. He says, but think on me when it shall be well with thee. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. Then we get to our text in verse number 23. It says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Joseph was forgotten. Joseph seems to be forgotten a lot of his life. But that's why we see so many times where he keeps going back over and says, The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Everybody else could forget, but the Lord was with him. When the world forgets the things that should be remembered, there's a lot of things that can happen. It may be discouragement. It can be destruction. But how do we get to the point where we don't forget? How do we continue to remember? What are the things that we as a people right now today, God's children, what are we supposed to remember? Easy to forget a lot of different things. Amen? Some of you forgot some stuff before you got here this morning. How do you remember what God wants you to remember? What are the things that you're supposed to remember? Number one, remember the person. Remember the person. You know, that butler... 
I guarantee you he'd never forget his time in prison. Amen? I don't think one day that they'd ask him, he'd say, you ever been to prison? You know, I just don't remember. No, he's going to remember everything about it. He probably learned about prison food about that time. He learned that as a butler, uh, the service that was done to you in prison, probably not the best. He would likely serve with the new attention to detail because of the memory of his event, his time in prison. He learned that if the king has a bad day, you might also have a bad day. A lot of things that he had learned, but he had forgotten Joseph. Think about it. How in the world? How do you forget Joseph? Man, Joseph, he, he had been the perfect servant everywhere that he went. He was a perfect servant to his father. He was a servant to Potiphar. He was a servant to the jailer. He was even a servant to the inmates. It says that he served them, and yet he was forgotten. He even told the chief butler that we saw there in verse number 14, he says, remember me. Whenever you go, remember me. Look back at it again. Verse number 14. There's four parts to it. He says, uh, think on me when that shall be well with thee. Show kindness, I pray thee, unto thee. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh. Bring me out of this house. He says, think on me. Think on me. That's a reasonable request. Amen. He didn't ask for payment. He's like, hey, think on me. You owe me $19.95 for the interpretation of that dream. And I want my money. You bring it back. He wasn't interested in that. It was, his, it was the faithfulness and, and the help that should have been easy to remember. Man, he had been such a, he, he said, I'm just, just trying to interpret, just trying to help, just trying to be a blessing, just wanted you to know some truth. Surely the butler valued his life. Surely he was thankful for that. Surely he put a value upon that. You know, the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How hard would it be to remember the one that set you free? How, would it be, how hard would it be just to think on the one that delivered you? Then he says, uh, he says show kindness, I pray thee. Show kindness, that's a, that's a favor. That's not something that's earned. It's been said that men too often write their grudges in marble and their favors in water. We remember all the things we're not supposed to remember to infinity, but all the good things we just kind of pass aside. That's part of human nature is to remember the bad instead of thinking on the good. Joseph was asking for the butler. He says, uh, think as a delivered man, not a captive man. Don't think on the old things, the things that are so bad. He said, think about the good and what it is that brought you to that point. Show some kindness to me. And third, he says, he says, make mention of me. Make mention of me and the Pharaoh. The things that you talk about, you don't forget. Amen? That's why it's good to be able to talk about some things on occasion. Rehearse some things. I always like listening to the family stories. My granddaddy would always share uh, different stories whenever he was growing up, different people that were there. I didn't know any of the people, didn't know the places, but boy, it felt like I was there whenever he would share a story. There's something about that because it, it helps your memory. It helps your understanding of what's going on. It's good to be able to talk about some things, especially whenever we start thinking about the Lord. So good to be able to think about the Lord. Amen. That's why the Word of God and the fellowship with the saints is so very important for us today. It's good to be in the Word of God. It's good to gain something from the Word of God. It's good to share the things that you learn. Hey, did you ever see this in Scripture before? You probably read it a thousand times, but I just realized it's good to be able to share it. Think about it. how much of the Word of God have you forgotten? No, no real way to know it, amen? But how many times have you looked at something and think, man, that's the most rejoicing thing I've ever seen. I have never paid attention to that passage. That's the greatest passage I've ever known. And then later on you think, you know, I hadn't seen anything lately. It's good to be able to share it. Talk to somebody about it. Oh, it'll help you to remember it. David spoke of the Lord. He said in Psalm 145, Verses 3 and 4, he says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I love that. One generation shall praise thy works to another. Sharing all the things with the kids. How great that God is. And declare all the mighty acts. He goes on, verse 7, he says, They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Man, that's awesome. Just that verse in itself. It doesn't say, yeah, yeah, talk about Jesus. No, no. He says, utter the memory of thy great goodness and sing of thy righteousness. Then he goes on, fourth thing, he says, and bring me out of this house. <laughs> Amen. He says, hey, remember me, talk about me, think about me, but get me out of here. Joseph didn't want to stay there. Amen. 
He didn't say, listen, just think about me a little bit on a case. Stop by and visit. It'd be good to see a familiar face. He said, get me out. Listen, you could have the best bed in jail. You are still in jail. <laughs> Amen. Man, you can't come and go. It's, it's not a pleasurable place to be. They didn't make the jail and say, we're going to make all these really, really miserable. But this one spot, let's just kind of spice it up a little bit. Put a flower on the wall. Make it just a little homey. No, he said, get me out. You know, you think about all these people that we see. Every, every person's got a different story, got a different ending. You know, for, the, for the butler, what a chain of events. Maybe he was a servant his whole life. Probably grew up learning what it meant to be able to serve others. So whenever it got to the point, whenever the, whenever the king of Egypt, when the Pharaoh's looking for a servant, guess who he wants? He wants somebody that knows how to serve. Amen? He doesn't want somebody that's always dumping the hot coffee on him. Oh, that'd be me. Never be a waiter in my life. I would douse so many people. That tray, I don't know how they do it. My hand doesn't even turn that way. Just be a constant dumpage going on. That butler, he had to have some kind of a background. Where, man, maybe his whole servant was a, or his background was a servant. Same would be true for the baker. That baker, I, you know, maybe it was that he went to the, the, the greatest of the culinary schools and he went, he progressed up to the very tip top of the culinary arts. Man, he knew how to bake things. He knew how to make everything just right. So he gets hired on with the king. Joseph, of course, we already talked about, he he's, has his own story. And yet all three of them in the same place of condemnation. All of them still in prison. All of them need to be delivered, regardless of whether they were a servant, whether they were privileged, or, or whether uh, they were Joseph and, and a, you know, a great worker and, and faithful and all those things. They were still in the same condemnation. And if a man that was once a prisoner gets set free, he should remember, that, you know, there's some others that want to be free too. There's an interest there. If we think about 9-11, it can be forgotten whenever it's just an event. It's easy to forget whenever it's just something that you see in the history book. It's the people that make us remember. The truth is, we can all forget. We can get into the routines of, of life so that we forget the one that set us free from the very bondage of sin. We may remember some events that occurred. We remember church. We remember a revival service. We'll remember a conference. But if we forget the person that caused the events to be such a blessing, we're going to forget the purpose that we've been given. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ should be the most important person in your life. It's by the blood of Christ that our sins are forgiven. The remission is a, a, of that sin is attained. Uh, you're not saved by religion. Amen? It was empty religion that caused people to fly planes into buildings. Religion is not what it is that a person's looking for. But if it's the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, that's to be remembered and honored to be. He's the one that, that took your sin upon Himself. He's the one that died in your place. He's the one who went to the cross at Calvary. It wasn't an event. It was your salvation. And we should be talking about it, and we should be rejoicing over Him. We should be making mention of His name. We should never forget it. It shouldn't be just a thing, well, I went to church. Good. Did you hear about the one who set you free? Did you talk about Him? Did you sing about Him? Did you praise Him? Did you, did you thank God that you lived in a place with the freedom so that you could hear about the very Son of God who, who, who took all your sin and gave you a free pass so that you could go to heaven, so that you could know victory today? And yet we just kind of gloss through it and it's not a big deal. Imagine Joseph. He says, they forgot me. Can you imagine our heavenly Savior? Saying, oh, even in the meeting, things are going on. Man, it's going good or it's going bad, but they forgot me. You want to know the things that you need to remember? Remember the person. Oh, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Him. Before long, we just don't think about Him the way that we should. Let me say this. It is a blessing to the very heart of God whenever we come to ourselves like that prodigal son did and whenever he realized that he was down in the slop pen and, and he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't fit for anything, but he says, I will get back to my Father's house. It is a blessing. Boy, you can see the Heavenly Father. Whenever a person gets to the, comes to themselves and there's a repentant heart and they get back to him and he runs out and grabs you up and kisses you on the neck and says, man, I'm glad you're home. When we just remember him. It's an exciting time whenever the conscience is pricked by the memory of the Savior. Later on, chapter 41, verse number 9. Uh, uh, look at it real quick. Chapter 41. Verse 9, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh. This is after he's having his dream trying to figure it out. He says, saying, I do remember my faults this day. 
Think about that. He had forgot him. All of a sudden, he remembers. He says, oh, I remember my faults this day. I, I don't know about you, man. I could hear the, re the regret in his voice when he realized his own ingratitude, and he realized that his king was being tormented, and he's got the answer to, for the whole thing. It was in that person that he knew. Oh, but there's, there's restitution whenever he speaks of Joseph. All of a sudden, it's, it's okay. Man, let me tell you. I hadn't told anybody in a long time, but let me tell you about the one. How do we not forget? Well, we remember the person. Secondly, stay faithful. Stay faithful. And we think about Joseph. Joseph was a man, he had been faithful his whole life, yet it hadn't resulted in favor of man. All of a sudden, it seems like every time you turn around, Joseph has fallen down a notch. He's getting kicked while he's down. Of anybody, you'd look and say, why would you stay faithful? Why would you be interested in keeping on? Why stay faithful now? It's because he, his service was ultimately a service to God. Every time he was faithful in whatever position it was, whether it was as a son or a servant, a slave, a, a prisoner, it was always because he was faithful to God. That's why we serve. If we serve for the accolades, for the approval of man, we won't serve long. Because the first time you get kicked in the ribs by the person that you're trying to help, uh-uh. Now you're done. But whenever you realize that you're serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and whatever it is that man may do to me, it's going to be fine because I've got a reward that's coming. By God, you'll keep going. We're told four times the Lord was with Joseph. You know, people lose track of time and, and things of importance. Can I tell you, God never does. God never loses those important things. Look at it, chapter number 41, verse number 14. It says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Joseph goes from, from prison to shaving to changing clothes, being brought before Pharaoh. Even uh, later on, number two man, amen, by the time it's all said and done, probably seemed fast. Amen? Think about how quick that was. Seems like it happens fast to us. We talk about it a lot of times. One day it made a difference. One day Joseph was in prison. The next day he's, he's in control. Boy, he's in charge. It wasn't like that for Joseph. How do we know? Well, chapter 41, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, and stood at the river. Man, for two full years, Joseph didn't know what in the world's going on? Joseph doesn't have an answer. Joseph probably sat there the, the first day saying, oh man, the butler's going to be coming. Second day, he was probably thinking, well, you know, the butler's probably busy getting reinstated and everything. And, oh, you know, that whole Pharaoh King birthday and everything. But probably right after the birthday, right, probably around Christmas, I bet he's going to bring a good Christmas present. He's going to tell me this is going to be, the, oh, well, you know, around the spring holidays, that's whenever, oh, new life, that's two full years. No answer. No understanding. That's where faithfulness is so important. It's trusting God in the uncertain days. The things that you don't know. Anybody can be faithful when everything's good. Amen. Oh, but whenever it's, whenever you don't know, whenever you don't know what the answer is, that's where faithfulness is really determined. He didn't go straight from, uh, to being that favored son to being the, the ruler. But Joseph had some promises of God and he grew into those promises. Joseph had, was going through what many Christians go through today. He was enduring this time where he was facing difficulties. He was going through some hardships. And think about it. Man, the butler didn't help. Amen? I mean, honestly, the one that you think, that's going to be the one that's going to help me, it turns out to be more of a thorn. But his faithfulness, it was dependent upon the power of God. You know, it's impossible to be faithful without the power of God. It's impossible to do. You can't do it in your flesh. God's not getting pleasure in your suffering. You're going through a hard time. He's not sitting there saying, oh man, I'm going to get them again today. But what is he doing? He's molding you. He's molding you for a time that he's going to be able to use you. And he does rejoice at seeing you start to take shape in his purpose. We've been looking at the, uh, the book of Job on Wednesday nights. We ain't got there yet, but in Job 23, verse number 10, it says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. What a great assessment. Whenever I come forth, man, it's going to be settled. Maybe that God was protecting Joseph rather than punishing him. 
I mean, sometimes we think of a hardship and say, well, God, why are you punishing me? Maybe he's protecting. Maybe, uh, maybe God understands some things about Potiphar's wife. And maybe he says, look, the safest place you could possibly be is in jail because your integrity is going to be shot. And I'm not going to be able to use you if you don't have the kind of testimony that's going to be pure for me. He says, if you want to deliver your family later on, if you want them to live, you know, it's probably going to be best that you're going to be protected and set aside. So he says, I'll protect you right over here so that you don't have to go through that. You know, God's got a lot better ways than ours, amen? How could Joseph do all that God wanted to do if he wasn't the man that God wanted him to be? So when the time came, Joseph was faithful to speak boldly. Now, now get this. He's getting out, gets out of prison, gets all washed up, he's shaved, he's all cleaned up, comes before Pharaoh, and whenever he's going to speak, he's not going to just share all of the, the ideas that he has. He's not going to share his opinion. His goal is to share God's Word. Amen? It's God's Word. Chapter 41, verse number 28. So here it is. He's, I'm skipping over a little bit. Uh, Pharaoh shares the dream. What does this mean? Nobody knows. He says, I'll tell you. Verse 28. He says, this is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. Uh, what God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there cometh seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. Isn't that something? Doesn't that sound like us? All the plenty shall be forgotten in all the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following. For it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and that God will shortly bring it to pass. Now think about Joseph's faithfulness here to the truth. He's been in prison for a long time. He's, he's about to give a message to Pharaoh, and if Pharaoh doesn't like the message, he could very well go back to prison, or he could be like his baker friend that had his head lifted off him. It was just that easy. Joseph knew the danger, but he was going to share the news regardless of how Pharaoh took it. Joseph knew that God, by his power, had brought him out of prison, and that uh, for that very moment, and he was going to be faithful to God. He was going to give the word exactly the way that it was. He wasn't going to stop and say, oh man, there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then the other. It's, it's kind of sketchy. I don't know. And he didn't start smiling whenever he said, and then there's going to be this seven years of famine like you have never seen. <laughs> That'll teach you. Now he just said, here it is. Here's the plenty. Here's the famine. Here's the hardship. Here's the good. You know, we're to be just as faithful to provide the words that God gives to us. We're to tell people about the coming danger. And those that are without a Savior, what do we do? We tell them about the one who set them free. We're to tell others how to prepare for the future. It's not about our opinions. It's about God's Word. And in a world that is forgotten, it's the responsibility of the child of God to be faithful. Sometimes we forget. We get so caught up in the routine that we forget our job is to be faithful. Our job is about a person. How do we not forget? Number three, and we'll be done. Control what you can. Control what you can. What do you mean by that? You know, there's plenty of things that, that go against a Christian. Amen. We often talk about the big three. The world, the flesh, and who? The devil. the devil. Amen. There's something else that often happens, and it's the mind. It's the things that go on in our mind and how much that we allow that to control us. We start thinking the, about our past failures. We start thinking about uh, our own inadequacies. We have thought about whatever we ever try for God, it's just going to flop. I'm not even going to try anymore. We fall into that trap. We start to pity where we are. We start thinking that we've got every, we, we already know how bad it is, already know how wrong it is. I'm just not, it's not worth the effort. It's always worth the effort. God's always worth our effort. Amen. Who knows what God is going to equip you to do? Joseph could have done that. Man, he could have been the greatest complainer. Amen. Joseph, honestly, he could have played the, the part of Eeyore all day long. Here I am again, back in jail forgotten by everybody, probably don't even care. You know, he could have done it. But there was a difference. Proverbs 17, verse 27 says, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. I love that. A man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. 
What does that mean? It, it doesn't say, all right, a man that has everything good is of an excellent spirit. A man that has no problem, he is an, of an excellent spirit. He says, no, no, a man of understanding. What do you have to understand to have an excellent spirit? You understand that God is the one that's on the throne. You understand that God's timing is perfect and he's the one. Man, he's in charge. He's the greatest. That they, all I got to do is be faithful. I've got an understanding of who God is and what God wants me to do. He just wants me to be faithful. And as such, man, I can have an excellent spirit. You can control some things in your life. You can control whether or not you're having a good day, whether you're having a bad day, so, uh, you know, uh, to, to a degree you can't. There's going to be things that happen. You can, you can control how you react to it. You can control your actions to it. You can control to set your eyes upon God instead of the problems. Control what you can. Don't fall into that pity about where we are. So instead, he, he kept his attention on what he could control. I started thinking, how much the life of Joseph and Daniel are so similar? Man, from the captivities to the promotions, the exaltations, everything. And Daniel 6, 3 says this, then Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because what? What was it? Because he could interpret dreams too? No, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. There's a lot that, there's a lot that rests upon our attitude. Amen. A lot about our spirit. A lot about our dependence upon God. Joseph, Joseph wasn't in charge of his location. Amen? Pharaoh didn't say, you're going to jail. Nah, I don't really want to today. I might stop in. About four or five years from now, I might be bored. I'll stop in, but, but I'll just stay for a couple of hours. Now. He wasn't in charge of his location, but he was in control of his attitude and his actions. The butler, back in chapter 41, verse number 9, nine he said, I do remember my faults this day. I tell you, we do a much greater fault when we forget not the king of Egypt, but the king of kings, the Lord of lords. We forget that we're supposed to stay faithful. We forget that we can honor God in our attitudes and our actions. We live in a world that remembers events. We, we live in a world that, that promotes that remember the event, but they're ignorant of eternity. You know, in a world that's forgotten, we've got a responsibility to remember the Savior, to speak of Him, to be able to share the message of salvation. If you're here this morning, you're not sure of your eternity, why don't you come? I'll show you in the Word of God how you can know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. When you die, you'll be in heaven with Him. Maybe you've had the kind of life like Joseph had, and you're wondering when it's going to be better. It may be that God's protecting you. It may be that God is preparing you for His work. But ultimately, our job is to keep our eyes upon Him, honor Him. Let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. <clears throat> our Lord, we want to thank You for today, for the grace that You extend to us, for, Lord, uh, giving us these things that we often remember, but instead reminding us that You are the most important thing in our life. And I pray, God, that You would help us to always be mindful of our salvation, our Savior. Lord, keep our attention focused upon You. We thank You, Lord, for the grace that You extend. We thank You. God, we can't thank You enough for the freedoms that we have today. Sometimes we need to experience a little bit about what it's like to lose those freedoms so we'll appreciate them all the more. And Father, I ask that as we think of all these things, the privilege that you've given us to be able to hear your word, to know your word, and to know you, God, I pray that you would help us to be committed to you. I pray, Lord, that we're yielded to you and your spirit, your direction, your interest. God, I pray that it's so, we know that your will is so much more important than ours. And I pray, Father, that you would help us. And Lord, if there's one here that does not know Christ as Savior, I pray that they not let another day go by. I pray that they would seize the opportunity to live for you. Lord, to be able to have sins forgiven. Oh, Lord, what a great life that it is. There's so many that are just like what happened 19 years ago. They're just going about their daily life not knowing what's about to befall them. And Lord, I think about those pictures of those that jumped to their death to avoid a, a fire. Oh, Lord, I pray, God, that you would give each person a heart to jump out of the very hand of Satan, to receive Christ as Savior, to know eternal salvation. We want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing page 308, I Surrender All. If you need to come and pray, why don't you come and pray this morning? <clears throat> if you need to be saved, why don't you come? Be glad to show you in the Word of God how that you can know that you belong to God. 308. 
All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me jesus take me now i surrender all i surrender all all to thee my blessed savior I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truly. Know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Let's sing that fourth verse. All to Jesus, I surrender, Lord. I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Amen. Appreciate you so much for being here this morning. Hope the Lord gave you something you can chew on. Amen. Man, what a great God that we have. I hope you'll be back this evening. And uh, we'll be looking at 1 Timothy chapter number 6. If you want to read ahead and be prepared, ready to go. Amen. And choir practice, 515 this evening. And so make sure that you be here for that as well. Brother Boatman, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?